So we don't want to test COVID positive. We want to test Christ positive. And so to do that, we got to get the promises of God into our life. And last week, we started talking about the promise of heaven. And we, to, to, to look at that, we went to uh, Revelation chapter 21 and looked at the first five verses. And uh, we learned how in heaven, there's going to be a whole new creation, new heaven and earth. That was pretty cool. Um, we're going to learn about there's going to be a whole new world order and how things operate. That's going to be cool. We learned how we're going to have new life, experience new life inside and out. We're even going to have new bodies. And so we talked about that. And so really cool. If you want to kind of catch up, go back to that message online and you can fill in on all those details of heaven. Some pretty amazing stuff in the book of Revelation. And so um, there's more though. And then and in Revelation gives us a few other things that we often don't think about heaven as being in heaven. But we got to go back to uh, Jesus' teaching in John 14. And this is what he says. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my house are many rooms. Okay? If it were not so, I'd have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So what does he mean that in my house there's many rooms? Are we talking about, you know, uh, you know bunks in, in a cabin with a camp? Are we talking apartments? Are we talking low apartments, low-cost housing? What are we looking at? You know, what kind of rooms are, is there going to be room to hang up stuff and decorate? You wonder about this stuff. At least I do. And I got to kind of help you understand it's going to be better than that. Heaven's good. When you talk about rooms, we're going to see in just a second. Yeah, there's going to be some pretty amazing rooms. And so I want us to go back to Revelation 21 and look specifically at verses 2 and 3. And this is what John says. He says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of, uh, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. I mean, that has an amazing prom- a bunch of amazing promises in there. In this passage, though, heaven is described as an actual enormous city. We don't usually think of that when you think of heaven, but it's a city. They call it the New Jerusalem or the city of God. He also describes it as the bride of Christ. We won't have time today to kind of talk about that. But understand that the city of Jerusalem to the Israelites back in the day, it was more than just a capital of a state. It was the heart of their nation. It was their spiritual heart. It was the core of their being. It was the source of their national pride, their united fellowship, their common loyalty. Their whole esprit de corps was rooted in the city of Jerusalem. Um, The temple was in Jerusalem. So several times a year, Israelites would travel to Israel and worship the high, celebrate the high celebrations. And the temple was there. So if you wanted to go meet with God, You would go to the temple in Jerusalem and offer sacrifices, and you'd have this, you know, God connection in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was just, it was an important place to the people of Israel. And so when Jerusalem was destroyed, it was a death of a nation. It was a death of a people. And so what we learn here, though, in in heaven, there's going to be a new Jerusalem, a new city, a new place that serves all those same old purposes, only at a greater level. And it's not going to just be for the Jewish folk. It's going to be for us. It's going to be our home. It's going to be the home we've always longed for with family. It's going to be our new family. And then we're going to experience a fellowship there that we haven't ever experienced here, even in the best of families. That's what we have to look forward to. Uh, Remember that this world is not our home. Okay, we get, we get attached. Just remember, anything we experience here is not for real. It's not forever. This world is not our home. This is the home we have to look forward to. In Hebrews 11, verse 10, it says that Abraham was looking forward to the city with real foundations, whose architect and builder was God. That's the city that we're describing here. In Hebrews eleven sixteen, it says, All the men and women of faith in the Old Testament okay, were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is that city. This is the new Jerusalem. And so what we learn is that the center of heaven is going to be this this city where we dwell in fellowship with God and each other forever. It's kind of a cool vision when you begin to think about it. But Revelation 21 goes a little further. 
And it really kind of blows our minds with some of the descriptions. So I want you to read on with me Revelation 21, verses 9 through 19. Well, in this case, verse 11. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and said to me, Come and I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, great and high, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It's going to be beyond our imagination. And, you know, the beauty... You know, there's a lot of beautiful things in this world. When we see that, we're going to be, our breath is going to be taken away. He goes on in verse 15. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure it, the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. And he measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia. Some of your versions might say furlongs. In length and as wide and high as it was long. He measured its wall, and and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper, and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city, uh, city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. So I first want you to get a grasp of the outside, the dimensions, you know, what it kind of looks like. And so the city is described as this cube, the length, the width, the width, and the height all being the same. For those of you who are Star Trek fans, this is not to be confused with the Borg, okay? I know that when I read the, man, that sounds like the Borg. No, what, what we see here is it's not artificial. It's not mechanical. It doesn't assimilate people. It's real. It's alive. It's beautiful. In fact, who you are as an individual is going to become complete in heaven. Because in that kind of fellowship, we don't become enmeshed we become spectacularly individual revelations of God in our own unique right. That's what we have to look forward to. But the outside, you know, it looks like this cube, and we're going, what is that about? And so, you know, but it's going to be kind of the city. It shines with the glory of God. It's, it's, it, the word, the Hebrew word is Shekinah glory. If we were to talk about it in our language, we would say it's supernatural, full-spectrum lighting, okay? It, it just, and nothing can be hid, Nothing's hidden in heaven. Now you're going, I don't know, I want to hide some things. Don't worry about it. In heaven, there is no shame. There is no guilt. There is no condemnation. There is no judgment. We don't have to worry about wearing masks like we do here, by the way. You know, we all come in with some masks. We don't want to let everybody, we think, if they really knew who I was, they'd just throw me out. No, you guys, you'd be surprised if I could blow you away with my own story, and I'm not going to do that, you know, maybe some other message. And each one of us are broken. Each one of us have troubles in our life. But we are saved by the grace of God. And the grace of God, there are rules. And therefore, the light can shine. We have nothing to hide, no mask to wear. We can just be who we are in Jesus. So, you know, that's the light. And it, it shines. Grace, mercy, forgiveness, and love will be there. In verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 21 through 23, he goes on. And it says, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Okay, well, that's not interesting. Each gate was made of a single pearl. Okay, think about that one. The great, city, the, street, the great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass, and I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. One of the big debates when you come to the book of Revelation is this question, is it literal? And, uh, you know, people have arguments over this. And, you know, is it literal or symbolic? And I think it's a mix. But here, and there's a lot of places which I think there's no question there's much symbolism here. And so I think there's some symbolic stuff here. But here, I, I, what I want you to understand about symbolism in the Bible, maybe not other places, but in the Bible. In the Bible, the reality is always greater than the symbol used to describe it. Okay, you have to understand that importance. So in the world, we say something symbolic because then symbols is bigger than the reality. But it's not so in the Bible. The reality is bigger than whatever symbol it's used to describe it. So when we think about a pearl, the doors, the gates of being a single pearl, is that literal? I mean, how big is the oyster? You've got to kind of think this stuff through, and you go, well, I don't know. Maybe it's figurative or, you know, symbolic. 
And, but if it's literal, it blows your mind. It's, it's great. But if it's symbolic, it's even greater, and our mind can't even wrap itself around it. You see what I'm saying? So uh, you can take it either way. It doesn't bother me, literal. So this is just, even the literal description is amazing. But even a, more, a better example of what I'm talking about cons- uh, deals with the dimensions of this city. And this is always fun to explain to people. Consider the dimensions. Back in verse 16, it says he measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, as wide and as high as it was long. So there's the cube. First off, understand that a stadia or a furlong equates to about 1,500 miles. Okay, 1,500, so just, you know, stay with that figure. This means the ground floor level alone would cover well over half the United States. It would take two days to drive across. The walls are 260 feet across, which is almost the length of a city block. These walls themselves would contain over 400,000 cubic miles, not feet, of this jasper. Well, they call it jasper, but it's translucent, it's beautiful, you know, it's precious stone. And, uh, and so you have this jasper. If the city were laid out into blocks of 500 feet square, and if the streets were 100, 100 feet wide, our streets are what, 20, 25? I don't know what they are, 30, 40. But if the streets were 100 feet wide, there would be at least 15,840 blocks and streets to each side of the city. This would give a total of 250,900,600 blocks in the city. Now, if each residence were 100 by 200, that's over 20,000 square feet. And most, that's a mansion. None of us have houses that have that much square footage. 20,000, okay? You know, there would be 12 residences or mansions in each block, okay? So what that means is this would be a total of 3,010,867,200 residences, on the ground floor alone. You with me? Okay, we're not done yet. Remember that this thing goes up. It's not just down. It's, there's story. So it's 1,500 miles up. That means the story is as high as our astronauts go when they orbit Earth. That's, you know. And so remember that the Empire State Building, what is that, 103 stories? You know how many stories this is? It's uh, 396,000 stories high. That's quite a bit. Okay. So if you have that many stories up, this is how many residents you would have. Let me, and pardon me, I have trouble saying this number. Here's how many residences are, could be fit in this thing. Okay. One quadrillion. 192 trillion, 303 billion, 411 million, 200,000 residences. Holy. Okay, that's, that's just what it. Now let's suppose we have 10 residences, or 10 people in each residence. By the way, if you could have 10 people in a residence of 20,000 square feet, you could go all day and not see each other. So you, let's just say 10 people in each residence. What that means is we have a total... <laughs> Of 11 quadrillion, 923 trillion, 34 billion, 112 million inhabitants. Okay? Now, but you know, once you've caught your breath and said, I don't believe it, I want you to consider a verse that's back earlier in the book of Revelation. Revelation 7 9 says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which, t- uh, which no man could number, of all nations, kindred, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven. I, and I don't understand that. It's, you know, it's just crazy. But you can't count. If you wanted to count to a billion, you'd have to start now without stopping, not taking breaks, and it would take you 31 years to count to a billion. I didn't even think you could do it. But you can, apparently, if you counted nonstop for the rest of your life, you could get to a billion in 31 years. But you know what? If you wanted to count to a trillion, it would take you 31,000 years. One trillion. Okay, so we're getting some perspective here. And, uh, you know, a literal fulfillment, a literal fulfillment of this prophetic view of heaven would be amazing, right? 
But if it's just symbolic, shut up. It's just, we can't wrap our heads around it. And that's what we have to look forward to. That's why we can be Christ positive. This world is not my home. I'm just here for a short stay. I'm here for, this is a training ground where we get prepared for what our life, our eternal life is really meant for. And, that, and we're getting to look at what that looks like there. And I kind of want to go there. I have that. And as you get older, it gets more important. When you're young, you're okay. You got energy, your body's in good shape. But as you get older, dang, it's sounding pretty good. And so that's, that's the promise. And that makes us positive. But look what's on inside. There, look, let's take a look on the inside. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 3. So we're in chapter 22 now. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. So you've got this river of life flowing from the throne of God. Yeah. And then you have the, this tree. And of course, that's the same tree we read about back in the garden. It's the tree of life that was, you know, we were separated from you know, in, in Genesis chapter 3 when sin entered. We're, we have access to it now. And it's the tree of life. That's why the curse is no more. Death is no more. We have access to life. And of course, the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. You know, we pray the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. Here the kingdom has come. And we don't have to read the news reports every day of how insane stuff is happening in our world because God is not in charge. There, God will be in charge and it will be a good, just, righteous rule where all people will be able to live in unity under God's rule. And that's what we have to look forward to. And still, we can't really wrap our heads around it. You know, remember 1 Corinthians 2, 9, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived of what God has prepared for those who love him. So heaven's worth going to. It's worth hoping in. It can make us positive. And, uh, whatever, and remember, whatever your mind imagines, whatever your mind imagines, it's going to be better because we can't even imagine it. All right? Let's go a little farther. Revelation 21, 3 says, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. I want to remind you all that salvation is not about going to heaven. What makes heaven heaven? What makes heaven really good? The thing that makes heaven heaven is God is there. Jesus is there. Right now, we kind of experience him intermittently. Our God experience you know, we struggle with it in this world, but there, it's going to be face to face. We're going to have this deep, intimate relationship with the God of the universe. He is what makes heaven, heaven. And I got to tell you, if you don't like God here, you're not going to like it there. Because God is what makes heaven, heaven. His presence. This is where we need to talk briefly, and I'm, not, I'm almost done, about the alternative. And Mike, you're right. This is a good day to talk about hell, right? Yeah, it's like, okay. And in Revelation 21, back to 21, verse 8, it says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now, some people are going to die twice. We all die once, even Christians. And then we're resurrected. But there's the second death where, you know, there's an eternal separation from God. Now, I know that hell presents a problem for a lot of people. They really str- I struggle with it, to be honest. And there's a lot of theories and ideas, some biblical, some not. But I, let me just share with you a perspective that I've been gravitating to over the last 20-some-odd years, maybe 30 of my Christian experience. And I kind of I, I go along with C.S. Lewis. His view is that those in hell are there by choice. They want to be there. You go, why would anybody want to be in hell? Because in heaven, you need to surrender your life and your control to God. And for some people, that's too big a price. Like, uh, like the, the philosopher writer said, Milton, some people would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. And there's that choice of control. In order to experience this goodness that God's offering us, I have to let go of my control, my pride. 
I can't be boss of my life anymore. And some people just, man, they struggle with that. You know, and I got to be honest with you, I've worked with a lot of people over the years. And I've had people come to me in anguish and pain and suffering, and they tell me their story. And as I give them suggestions on what they could do to have instantaneous remedy and relief, they look at me funny and they say, I had to do that. Instead of doing the very thing that could give them life, they steadfastly hold on to the things that are killing them. And I've seen it time and time again. This is why C.S. Lewis suggests the gates of hell are locked from the inside. C.S. Lewis suggests that even if you were to bust a whole bunch of people from hell up to heaven, they'd recoil. They couldn't tolerate it. They wouldn't like it. In fact, if you let them into heaven, they'd just bring hell with them. Because hell is not just a place, it's how we are. When we don't have God in our life, we create hell wherever we go. And that's what we're looking at the world today. We see man's will run riot, and it creates a kind of hell. The Bible says hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's not tears of repentance. That's a Hebrew idiom for anger and frustration. It, 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 it's like a temper tantrum of people who aren't getting their way. And that's what hell is like. And so it's a hard concept, but we have to understand that God isn't forcing them there. There's always that, man, just accept my grace. But to accept grace and forgiveness, I have to give up my control and let him be Lord of my life. In the end, C.S. Lewis says there'll be two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, okay, have it your own way. And my question to you today is, which are you? Which group are you in? Which group do you want to be in? And I got to say, if you're struggling with stuff, we've all been there. And you guys, I can't overcome this. We've all been there. God is bigger than whatever you're facing. And all you need to do is surrender control and trust him enough to help you. See, the reason we can't trust is because we have to control. People who, I've got control issues, and when I'm in control, I can't trust. It's as simple as that. In order to trust God, I have to repent from my control. And I've got to tell you, I've done that too. It's like, it's like this instantaneous magic wand over my heart. I can have instantaneous peace and confidence. It's going to be okay when I let go of the idea that I have to have it my way and my will. And that's the promise is, Jesus, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's, it's there. And that's what makes heaven heaven. It's God and his glory and his grace. All I have to do is experience it. In John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in him. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I'd have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. Do you guys believe that? Amen. Let's all be standing for a closing word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for being bigger than us. Thank you for this promise of, an, of another place, another life that we have to look forward to. I thank you that this world is not all that there is. Thank you for Robert today, Father, and his decision to be baptized into you. And may that be an example to some others who may need to make that same step. Guide us today, Father. Help us to stay cool, but especially help us to stay cool in your grace and your love, because that's what really sustains us. So be with us the rest of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.